So welcome. Thank you very much for making the time to come out here. And I always like to start this particular series of talks that I've been giving just by pointing to this simple picture and suggesting that I can't really think of another plant that elicits such a strong gut visceral reaction than this particular leaf. For some reason, it's been hardwired into us. We sort of have made a decision, probably not this group, but let's speak for the wider country, has sort of made a decision somewhere along the way that it either has a tremendous healing benefit, the hemp cannabis plant, or we were told what, it was a gateway drug. It has no medical application whatsoever. There's nothing to see here and keep moving on. That's sort of the options that we've been given, correct? And I believe, and at the company I represent, Canavest, what we believe is that somewhere in the middle, we're probably going to find the truth. So I wanna start with this overarching theme as I go through my slides tonight, and please pay close attention to this. After 70 years of hemp prohibition, randomized control trials, RCTs, are finally warranted and indicated, and our government is growing the material in Mississippi to conduct, finally, research on this plant. So if randomized control trials are finally indicated after 70 years of prohibition, how much do we really know about what this stuff does? Not much. Not much. No, really, we can go back and say, well, they've used it for 10,000 years, and it's perfectly safe for me. But if we are just starting to understand the mechanisms of action, and we don't have the randomized control trials yet, does that not suggest that we should be a bit prudent with the way we talk about this compound? Does that make sense? I just came back from the International Cannabinoid Research Society Symposium, the 27th annual meeting. Who knew that they were meeting every year for 27 years? 100 lectures in four days of cannabis-based science. We were up in uh, Wolfsville, if you've ever been up in Halifax in the Bay of Fundy. It was quite spectacular. Sat there for a week. I listened to all of the science and realized we're standing there at the edge where we as a society can follow this science about this plant as it unwraps in real time which is both a challenge and it's a blessing at the same time, is it not? It's a challenge because I'm sure that some of you want to just know how many drops of this spray do I need for diabetes? How many drops do I need for arthritis? What is the prescription? And please, I'm just begging you tonight for the time we're together. If randomized control trials are finally warranted, we don't really know for sure yet, and that is okay because we can do this in real time. So let me tell you about the organization that I represent. I'm currently the Vice President of Human Nutrition for a company called Canavest. We've been in business for just a couple of years. I'm sure you can imagine this is a new emerging category, a disruptive business, if you will. And one thing that we're doing is not only bringing cannabis and hemp science into the natural products industry, but what we're really doing on some level is disrupting the cannabis industry. What I mean by that is, if we can provide not all, but many of the purported benefits of medical cannabis from agricultural hemp that we know has a better safety profile, a much lower if no risk of abuse, if we're giving people a legitimate botanical-based alternative, that could be quite disruptive, especially if it's effective. So what that means is that the people bringing these products to market had better have experience with the FDA. Do you agree with that statement? Anybody coming from the cannabis community, turning these products into dietary supplements or making them available to the general public should have experience in the dietary supplement space. Don't you agree? So I've done this for my entire life. I cut my teeth at North American Urban Spice. Some of you probably use the oil of oregano. I built that company with Dr. Cass Ingram. I was there for nearly a decade. Before that, I worked in a health food store just like this when I was a kid and I ran the juice bar. 
For those of you that are lifers at this, I used to read survival into the 21st century and remember Ann Wigmore and we had the wheatgrass juice and the rejuvelac. I was going to be a breatharian, remember that? And turn photonic energy right into protein. There's a lot. Of, we've gone through a lot of trends in the health world, you know. They, they are now, all the vegans are now becoming paleo. And anyway, it's been a lot of fun, as I'm sure you've had your own journeys, right? We bring our own health challenges to this. But I believe we need to bring proven expertise to bringing the most controversial plant in the world to the market. So this is what gives me some expertise in terms of botanical medicine. And then I went to go work for Nordic Naturals. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Nordic Naturals. I was blessed, really one of the greatest companies in our industry, to be their global educator. And I built this team here, uh, and we were educating all over the country and giving lectures and seminars and webinars, and it was just a delight to work for a company interested in science. They were not so mesmerized with features and bullet points and marketing, they loved science. And one of the scientists I met was this gentleman right here. His name is Captain Dr. Joseph Hiblin. He's at the NIH. And his division, the National uh, Division of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, he has to look at neuropsychiatric disorders and, and addiction and depression and all kinds of things where omega-3, as we know, is quite applicable. And he had shared a paper with me that really piqued my curiosity that had started talking about marijuana-like receptors in our bodies and compounds that we make and we've made all day long that are actually cannabis-like. So just like we make painkillers and we make serotonin and we are the greatest pharmacy you could ever imagine, we make every single chemical. We make cannabis-like compounds. And Dr. Hiblin had this theory. He was given a job to find out why are we so addicted to food. Now that's a heavy duty addiction, right? You think it's drugs and alcohol, let's face it, food's the biggest addiction. So they said, Captain Dr. Hiblin, please help us unlock the mechanism of action, the addictive part of food. That would be a big scientific discovery, would it not? So he published this paper here that says excessive omega-6 intake. Remember, the omega-6 from the seed oils, corn, safflower, sunflower, cottonseed. Excessive omega-6 intake induces marijuana-like compound receptors and promotes obesity. You've probably never heard of anything quite like this before, have you? There's something to I can't stop eating these french fries. Something to that. Negative effects of overconsumption of omega-6 was prevented by what? Consuming more omega-3, a story that you know about, the balance. The balance between omega-3 and omega-6. That's important. But what about the endocannabinoid system that was only discovered in 1992 that is the master control system? And I'm going to show you tonight. The master regulatory control system. And its job is to oversee everything else with one goal, global balance. The endocannabinoid system is designed to keep you in balance. What Captain Hiblin is suggesting here is when you go from butter and whatever we had 100 years ago and ghee and all of those things to seed oils and you increase soybean oil consumption 20,000 fold from the turn of the last last century, you're driving an imbalance which creates hyperactive endocannabinoid tone which is similar to smoking marijuana and getting the munchies. Isn't that fascinating? and might be leading to obesity. I mean, this is something quite remarkable. So when, when I started to see this CBD product come onto the market, and I was working for Nordic Naturals, traveling around all the trade shows and doing what I do, I knew that there was this new emerging area of phytocannabinoids, and I found a manufacturer selling something at a trade show a couple of years ago, and I figured out who was who and who grew the material. That video you saw early on, that's our grow. That isn't stock footage of hemp. That's 3,000 acres in Holland of where the stuff is grown. So I figured it out, and I moved companies. I quit Nordic Naturals. I ran to do this. And when I got hired, about two weeks later, this full-page ad was running in the New York Times. And it's small print, so I'll read it for you so you can see it. The woman running says, Molly prefers Kali Mist 
to relieve pain. While beating cancer, Ian used Blue Dream. What's your strain? Yet they're talking about medical cannabis, hemp. A $200,000 ad buy in the New York Times. We, we, we can't just be in denial that this is happening. This is happening. And some of these patients are getting results. But my hope, my hope is that we get away from that and we get into the deep science of the phytocannabinoids. And if you can eat the stuff as a medicine and you don't have to smoke anything and you're not getting high, this is a completely different narrative. Does that make sense? This is a wellness narrative. Now, if you go to leafly.com, you can download their app, our department, the natural products division that I head up, we write the content for them every month in the form of sponsored scientific articles. And I got a kick out of this. The first article we sent over, they said, nobody wants to go this deep. Nobody wants to really know the science of this stuff. I said, I beg to differ. Because people that are really interested in something like, let's say you're interested in automobiles. You might be interested in knowing everything there is to know about automobiles, or sports, or history, or art, or whatever we're into. Well, our articles are the most widely searched on Leafly because we're bringing the referenced science. So that's how you can stay current. Go to leafly.com if you want to learn about what's happening in the movement. And then I saw this over the summer. Did anybody see this last summer? Both Nat Geo and Time Magazine, their cover stories. My grandmother, she's 95, she sent me these and said, it looks like you're onto something, right? And my focus is here again, the science of marijuana, not this. I don't think that's the narrative. That is the discovery. So for those of you that have not seen the CNN documentary that started all of this, I'm going to play a little clip for you. It's touching, it's moving, and if you haven't seen it, it's emotional because we're dealing with children where nothing else will help them but CBD from hemp cannabis. So I want you to watch this little clip and then we'll continue our training. This might be hard for some of you to watch. their daughter Charlotte having a seizure. We just thought it was just one random febrile seizure. By the time she was two though, the seizures had become constant and started to take their toll on their once happy, joyful little girl. She started to really decline cognitively and she was slipping away and she just wasn't keeping up with her twin. The figgies finally found an answer. It was awful news. Dravet syndrome. It is severe intractable epilepsy. The seizures start during the first year of life and are unstoppable. As a last resort, doctors wanted to either prescribe a powerful veterinary drug used on epileptic dogs or put Charlotte in a medically induced coma so her brain and body could rest. For Paige, those were not good options. But maybe, just maybe, marijuana now was. She'd failed everything. Uh, there were no more options for her. Everything had been tried, except cannabis. Here's how scientists think it might work. Marijuana is made up of two ingredients. THC, that's the psychoactive part that makes you high, and CBD, also called cannabidiol. It's the CBD that scientists think modulates electrical and chemical activity to help quiet the excessive activity in the brain that causes seizures. The work on cannabis and epilepsy was sort of inconclusive. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. They couldn't quite figure it out. And it's only when they really started separating THC from CBD that they saw, you know, definitively, yes, CBD seems to really stop seizures. And it's research that could give hope to patients like Charlotte Figge. <laughs> They've been able to show that it can decrease the amount of brain damage from head injuries right. in mice. To be able to give a medicine after the injury to reverse some of the damage, that's huge. I literally see Charlotte's brain making connections that haven't been made in years. It's almost seeming to build her brain where before it seemed broken. So we get the opportunity to go work for Canavest and it's a big decision, you know, midlife, got a family, have a career moving across the country. 
And I, I, I beseech you, go back. They're all on YouTube. Watch. There's one, two, and three. Watch these documentaries. This is important. This is, this is game-changing stuff. And there's tears streaming down from our faces. And I looked at my wife and I said, what do you think? And she said, you spent your entire life at the service of others. Rent, think about what is the rent we pay for our time here on earth? Service. We know that. Well, I've spent my whole life in a hotel room pretty much. I'm happily married, that helps, with an amazing family, on the road year after year after year giving talks like this, trying not to give you a sales pitch ever, giving you tools, teaching people about science and not overselling it. This is the juggernaut of stories of all time. What is the biggest complaint about herbal medicine? That it doesn't work. That we don't fully know the mechanism of action. Well, guess what? This stuff works like nothing we've ever seen before and we're figuring out the mechanism of action. We as promoters and you as consumers, we have to be very, very cautious about how we communicate our experience with this ingredient because we don't want this to be about testimonials. We want this to be about very serious clinical research. Nothing else could help that little girl. They were going to put her in a medically induced coma on top of standard of care, they give her this non-psychoactive CBD oil. It's not something that gets her high. It's something that's just from hemp. We called it ditchweed. It's the same stuff we grew to make rope during the Second World War to fight the Germans. We grew that stuff in Kentucky. I mean, this is about as American as you can possibly get. And we've had this stigma that we've got to get out of our head. But let's remember, that it isn't all just 100% safe. There should be and are concerns. Look at this paper, Frontiers in Pharmacology. This is a fact. THC from adolescence onward limits the development of behavioral tolerance compared with chronic THC later in life. Yeah, when you're a developing brain, the stuff may actually limit learning and memory. Now listen to this. Well, all of a sudden, we gut reaction yeah, the first part of your life, maybe you need to remember everything. And at what point do you need to start forgetting? Is the adaptive benefit of forgetting something that has been overlooked and misunderstood? Let's say that most of what you need to forget was inaccurate anyway, or harmful in the case of post-traumatic stress disorder. If you have a traumatic imprint and a memory that you cannot edit, we call it pruning, you cannot let go of. Dysregulation in the endocannabinoid system has been absolutely intimately connected to the inability to forget or to let go. So maybe it's important that we remember everything the first part of our lives, and maybe we need to start dumping some information, does that make sense? The second half of our lives. The other point is, even if THC does have its own unique pain-killing mechanisms, which it appears as if it does, and it may have its own anti-cancer mechanism, which it appears as if it may, would something like that ever be able to be sold in a place like this? Probably not, <laughs> right? If it works as well as morphine and it treats cancer, it's gonna be a pharmaceutical drug, which it should be. Where an extract like this, that's really just a crude, artisanal, we were joking earlier, right? It's just a plant like any other plant that happens to contain unique compounds that do unique things. Now CBD by itself has been getting some tremendous coverage as you saw from the Sanjay Gupta CNN documentary, but here in April of last year, Medline, this is US National Library of Medicine published, seizures fell by an average of 54% on top of standard of care. So think about that. We don't need to raise any hands or any of that stuff, but we all have friends and family that are controlled with medication, correct? Blood pressure controlled, cholesterol controlled. In order to improve on standard of care to the tune of 54% on top of surgery, gabapentin, phenobarbital, do you know what they give these kids? That is historic. You cannot point, you don't get that with ashwagandha or echinacea or probiotics that I love and fish oil and all those things are very strategic and they're very important. But this further illustrates why we need to be so exact about what we say. 
Then December 14th, 2015, GW Pharmaceuticals, leading player in the medical marijuana space. I'll say that again. GW Pharmaceuticals is the leading player in the medical marijuana space. Did you know that? Did you know that the leading player in the world medical marijuana space was a pharmaceutical company? Pretty fascinating. Has the world trends on its side, and the best part is well financed. That certainly helps, right? Ramping up manufacturing facilities for its new CBD pharmaceutical prescription drug called Epidiolex. Multiple cannabinoid programs. Do you know what that means? Many drugs. There's 104 cannabinoids. There's CBD, there's CBG, there's CBN, and then the ratios of all those. Can you imagine what they're looking at? They're looking at generations of brand new pharmaceutical drugs. And look at this, possible takeover target for big pharma. So if you have any reservation at all about what this stuff is, by this time in the talk, I, I hope it's partially quashed, because this is happening. Big Pharma is not involved at this level unless there's something here. And let's keep in mind, as exciting as this is, Machiavelli probably said it best, there's nothing more difficult to carry out, nor more doubtful of success, uh, nor more dangerous to handle than to initiate a new order of things, for the reformer has enemies in all of those who profit by the old order. What is at stake? Not if you can come and buy this at a health food store. That's a secondary message. Here's the big message. What if you can grow it yourself? <laughs> what if your victory garden now turns into kind of a self-survival, post-apocalyptic, healthcare zombie economy treasure trove of taking care of yourself? Is there a threat with that? There is an enormous freedom issue here with that that must not go ignored. You, don't, you can grow it. And pretty soon you'll be able to grow hemp legally in your front yard, in your backyard, anywhere here in the United States of America. We are this close. So there's a lot at stake. What if we could, does anyone here know about the Mu opioid receptor? Does anyone know that receptor? You've heard of the Mu opioid receptor. CBD allosterically may modulate the mu opioid receptor and in some of the papers we can potentially titrate the patients down getting them on lower levels of opioids because we're actually getting greater confirmation in the presence of the active ligand. Isn't that fascinating? If just that is half true, what's at stake? Would you put that language on the screen? <laughs> you have a receptor have a you have a receptor site because your body makes opiates. So as you make these, you get this little confirmation and it's your body's natural way of dealing with pain and clearly that can get out of balance as it does, hence we feel pain. CBD appears to modulate the shape of the lock, allowing us potentially to bring the amount of painkillers down. They're using CBD to withdraw people from opiates. They're using people, taking people off of like drug addicts and helping to withdraw them from it. So it's not just people using it for surgery, it's also drug addicts. That is a huge benefit for society. We see what's happening with the painkiller problem. What about mental health issues, which we now fully must embrace as a culture, are now crippling absolutely everything. Let's face it, it's not the obesity epidemic. That doesn't seem to be causing us the nightmare that they told us it would. It's our mental health challenges. CBD works at the 5-HT1A site, that's the serotonin receptor site. Again, potentially, what we're seeing in early preclinical work is elevation of mood and modulating neurotransmission, sometimes upregulating serotonergic signaling, balancing dopaminergic signaling. This could be an adjunct therapy to people that are given Prozac and Paxol and all of those sorts of drugs.